Good evening. My name is Sean Roach, and I am your lead instructor this evening, uh, and your only instructor this evening, uh, to present the U.S. Soccer e-license, uh, which is, interestingly enough, uh, con constantly evolving. And 2015, this particular PowerPoint uh, is brand new. So welcome to the current word of U.S. Soccer. Why should we try and teach respect for the game? And all of the facets that are in the game, the referee, the opponents, the coaches, the fans, their equipment and nutrition, and, all, and our opponents for us to uh, want to respect their efforts as well. We need to try and teach our kids to love and learn the game and realize that the best teacher is the game. FIFA and all of the uh, associations throughout the world formed in uh, 1904 and having 207 members, all of them uh, playing the same game throughout the world. What should you not do when you're creating a PowerPoint? Yes, you shouldn't just put thousands of words uh, out there for people to dig through. But let's dig through this one, and I think what we'll find is we'll find Ignite. And this should inspire us to become an emotional leader for youth athletes, guide, nurture, nurture the passion that we have, incorporate age-appropriate and best practices, uh, train, become a master coach, try and constantly update uh, your coaching, develop your craft, and of course, the environment that we will try and help you to uh, have a methodology that will make your environment safe and productive and exciting and fun for your kids. US Soccer is the owner of the license. We're putting it on here in Southern California and we have, uh, this is the way that you'll be assessed. All the coaches have to show all four stages of a topic and we will work diligently uh, during the weekend to be able to have you feel comfortable and competent in writing an outline. You're going to have to do a practical, a practical field session or part of a practical field session on the final day. But once again, we're there as mentors. We're there to try and guide you through this particular session. Uh, on com completion of the uh, practical session, we will give you feedback uh, about what went on, how maybe we could uh, embellish it, how maybe we can make it better for the children. Um, it, the candidate who does not show the appropriate progression will uh, we'll give them a, a, a pathway to achieve uh, completion of this and also a road to the D license. You've already probably done this, if not you're working very diligently on it. This is the, the work that you had to do pre-work. Uh, the laws of the game, the concussion, and completion of one of the three uh, pre-course team management, and the completion of the written outline of a practical field session. Uh, you're going to hand those assignments in that you've done tomorrow when you go to the license. Uh, they all have to be in in order for us to award you a ready grade. I'm not even going to think about this last sentence because we're going to be positive in this course and think that you're going to be very successful. Cal South, this, we suggest to you that the results will take to 14 days for them to be processed and be back to you. Uh, you will be notified by email and the certificate will not be sent to you, uh, but you'll be able to print it out your own certificate through the Cal South system. Uh, when coaching with a CalSouth affiliate member, proof of license will be your member pass. You may obtain the member pass through your registrar. 
the D license is the next step of the licensing on the road to gaining a national license, uh, C, B or A, with US soccer. Um, you will have to wait six months after completing this if you feel as if you wish to go into the D license. The D license is a very competitive license and it's also a very active license. Uh, one would suggest that you may want to have prepared yourself physically a little bit in order to withstand it. It's, it's, uh, exists over two weekends that are divided by a minimum of uh, six or seven weeks and you have homework to do as well. This probably is one of the biggest bargains that you can have in youth soccer in Southern California. Sometimes US soccer and soccer in general in the United States tends to be the best secret keeper of all. Sometimes we don't know when the national team's playing, we don't know where the uh, international teams are coming because it's not very well shared with all of us. All of this information and other information can be gained by being a member of this. Networking amongst your brothers and sister coaches, the uh, getting materials and memberships, um, NSCAA, the sports session planner, all of this can be yours when you purchase this. And I believe that if you sign up early for courses, this may be free. So here, here is the pathway that uh, is the educational world and a pathway for you to be the most productive coach you can be in the United States. Here we are. We're here. Um, and the D is the next step. In order to go to a national C, B or A, one has to have the D license, which is the highest license in the state. Tonight, we're going to focus on Methods of Coaching 1 and Methods of Coaching 2. All of the rest we will do over the weekend in the classrooms. I believe this gentleman played for Juventus. I think he might have been a winger, uh, but nevertheless very, very uh, philosophical, I believe. Okay, what is the e-license? It's a, a license about the 9 to 12 year old. That's the uh, area and the span of years that we're going to look at at this particular time. We're going to look for developing core coach competencies to work with this group. We need to understand the characteristics and needs of this basic stage of the athlete development model. This license will allow you to establish a foundation of knowledge. So this is the beginning, a foundation of knowledge in order to proceed through the sequence of coaching developmental courses which we saw in the previous slide. The outcomes for us, we're hoping that you will effectively apply the principles of athlete development. Also, demonstrate the competency in planning an age-appropriate training session. Uh, we're going to work on that. Why? Because it's going to help you enjoy your coaching even more and also your players will enjoy what you have planned. We're also going to help you demonstrate the essential competencies to perform that training session. And it will be based on a technical function of the game. And then finally, to understand and recognize the principles of attacking and defending in small-sided games. Small-sided games so that when children come to practice, I think you probably know already, what they want to do is play. So we're going to try and help them to do that in a very constructive way. These are handouts that you'll be given. And we do it up front so that we don't, have, we don't hide anything. There's no smoke and mirrors. This is the form that you're going to do your writing, your uh, training session on. And we will go through every part of this during the lectures and the field sessions 
uh, during the weekend. This is the sheet that you actually get back after you've completed this weekend. And uh, within how many days? Checking for understanding. 14 days. So this will have to do with your written presentation. This area here will have to do with who you are and how you appear and how you present yourself. These we will talk about this evening before we have finished. These areas here are your written assignments and just uh, we need those. We need to make sure that they are uh, completed. The boxes at the bottom here, 6, 12, 18 and 24, this is a way for our instructors to give you uh, instant feedback on where you currently are, in their opinion, based on this weekend, in their estimation of, if you get a six, we would feel very comfortable in saying to you in six months, you should maybe go and try the D license. If we say 12 or 18, then we're feeling that Maybe if you use this information that you're going to get this weekend and use it for a year or 18 months, then maybe you think about going and uh, applying for a D license. And we will give you feedback, maybe specific comments, and of course, we'll put our name on it. Welcome to Methods 1 of the Athlete Development Model. What a fantastic age. What's so special about this particular age? We came from here, the initial stage. Remember those days? Body movement, being able to run and actually stay upright and kick the ball at the same time, make turns. So the activities that we did in those particular practices were more to do with outright fun and the relationship between the child and the ball and gravity. So what, what has become, what will be a point of uh, significance at this particular time of, the, of, their, of their life? We need to, as coaches, we need to understand and describe the technical, tactical, physical and psychosocial characteristics of soccer players in this particular stage of their development. Secondarily, we need to be able to describe the challenges of using chronological age to group players in a basic stage of development and then describe the opportunities that arrive uh, developmental windows presented in this basic stage again. There are four components of soccer, technical, tactical, physical, psychosocial, in our sessions we have to try and connect and correlate those. But they have to be relative to this particular stage. So chronologically, uh, we, most sports in America, other than football, probably every sport is divided into, divide their children into chronological age to make sure that it's fair and safe practices for them to compete in. But between the ages of 10 and 16, there could be as much as a four to five year developmental separation. I just want to show that picture because maybe that will make you or have you realize the physical separation. You can see by the dates on here that they are pretty close in age and they've all been very successful, so okay. So, who are these people? So, I want you to think about the children that you have or have known at 9 to 12. Attention uh, span? Not very long. Uh, are they active all the time? Uh, sometimes, sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. So, this picture, this slide, allows us to see the age developmental age, and the characteristics that they may have at particular times in their, in their life. If I was a 
gymnastics coach, where would I begin? What age would I begin to look for or look at children that might be or lend themselves to being successful in their sport? So if you're looking at that, maybe some of you will say, oh, six, seven, eight, and nine. Why? Because their suppleness will exist at that particular time, and without suppleness, uh, I don't know that you can go into gymnastics. I can't imagine myself at that age or any age being able to do a cartwheel, number one, but then do a cartwheel on a piece of wood that's four inches wide would be the kiss of death. But these children show that at that particular time. So we're talking about nine to twelve and what's happening. So you might say, what does PHV mean? Well, PHV is the peak height velocity. It's the time that their body is growing the most rapidly. Now, it's, this is a kind of a general, a general uh, view. It's not every single child will develop that quickly. But at this time, most children are developing their height, their most, the largest part of their adult height. This does give us some particular challenges in our training sessions at this particular time. But what, allow, what, what could we do at this particular time? And it says skills. So this is a great time for us to work on the technical ability of players to allow them, and don't forget the technique of soccer is the language of soccer, if you have good technique then you can probably pay for an extended period of time in the sense of a lifetime. If, you, if, you, if your technique is not as good as it could be, it kind of shortens your life in soccer because people tend not to give you the ball if, you don't, if you're not able to give it back to them. What else do we notice here? We notice that the females have this peak height velocity earlier in their lives than the males do. Being able to train speed post-PHV as opposed to prior to it. Why? Well, think about it. Let's think about this picture. If this, this child, would you say that's a good soccer build? Yes, because soccer is about center of gravity. This is a, this is a messy, right? Lots of, they gain strength, they have good balance, uh, they're able to turn. This child has just had a growth spurt. Let's pretend that. And what's the general opinion, or not the general opinion, but what's sometimes on the sideline, how does this child appear? And what would the comments be about that particular child or this child uh, after they've had some rapid growth? Some people will say they're lazy. Some people will say, oh, they're, they're, not, they're not as good as they were. Of course they're not. They're, they're, they're not. They've not lost anything. They've gained something, and they have to relearn how to run, how to turn, how to twist, and do it with a soccer ball. So we need to be educated to know how to use this particular time of their lives in the correct way. The challenge in a training session here well, I wonder what, what would you change in your training session uh, be, based on the fact that there's been a rapid growth in height. Where are the stresses for this child? The stresses are in the ankles, the knees, the hips, shoulders, elbows. Bones are still growing. But look, now we have maybe a larger concern because at this particular they may be stressed by nature. And now we have to look at how we train people going through that particular cycle. Strength training should come after that. Uh, and this is strength training. We're looking at strength training there more in terms of the weight room as opposed to uh, resistance training or their own body weight. But we'll get into this later on in the weekend, even in more depth. So here's what we're trying to teach them. Technique. Maximize their opportunities to be with the ball and to be comfortable with the ball and have it be their best friend. Uh, I was fortunate enough, 
for a while to be working in uh, Pro Plus, used to be ODP, and there were players, and I had the under-17 group boys. There were boys that came to camp, and they would take their soccer ball everywhere with them. They even slept with their soccer ball in their bed or in their bunk. That's having that development that the ball becomes a part of your life. So we need to have that individual technique and ball mastery. Ball mastery so that they're very comfortable and be able to receive it and not feel pressured from all of the other pressures that will arrive along with the ball. We also need to look at, be able to coach position related. If I'm a right back, then what behaviors or what technical, uh, specific technical abilities would I need? as opposed to a centre midfielder, a goalkeeper, or a centre forward. Realism and relevance to the game function. In this day and age, we've come to a time where we can make our training much more realistic and appropriate than ever before. Everybody has an iPad. I'm sure that you guys have an iPad or an iPhone. There's nothing wrong with you taking a part of the game or even a player during the game and then at practice maybe spend five minutes at the iPad looking to see this is why we're going to train this particular technique or this particular tactic because look at the game. Would the children watch it? Of course they will. Children love to watch each other and themselves uh, on film. So nowadays we can make our practices incredibly relevant to the game that they've just played. Unopposed environment is balanced with opposed. So normally at the beginning of practice we may not have too much opposition because we're going to spend time with that this, this ball mastery and technical area and we're going to allow them to be with the ball and maybe ask for some specifics. But then we have to put it in a competitive environment because that's the nature of the game. So we need to make sure that it's balanced and that there is opposition. Why? Let's see, let's test our technique to see whether we can keep the ball or use the ball to get around people with an opponent. Tactical. Game understanding and decision making. When does the decision making start? Do you allow decision making in your uh, practices? It's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it. Just think about it. Through the decision making can come through small sided games and activities, three versus three up to nine versus nine. These small sided games, they will, if, if you have the environment that is uh, allowing creativity and imagination to flourish, and you will be helping them to problem solve just through playing soccer. So m the design of your training session is as important as um, what you're asking for and teaching at that particular time. Psychosocial. I looked this up because the words psycho and social, uh, I was a bit mixed up because there aren't, I don't know if a psycho's uh, world is a very social world. I'm not too sure. It's supposed to be a joke. Nine to 12 years, self-confidence and motivation are highly influenced by peer, their peer attitudes and that coach, player, or the adult relationship that they have. Those interactions with you and with other adults that may be helping you, your assistant coaches. 9 to 12 year old, we need to encourage unstructured play and then structure competition to address differences in training age and abilities. The physical side, soccer deals with agility, balance, coordination and speed constantly. It's not just at this age but for sure this age uh, is as important as any other age. And Jürgen will take us into methods two this evening and we will uh, look to demonstrate an understanding of effective teaching methods relative 
to this particular age group. Secondarily, we'd like to check, learn how to check for understanding. Uh, the coach's toolkit, a very important part of your training, we hope. That, and you may already use it, but for sure, uh, you'll want to use it afterwards. And demonstrate and understand how to create a child-centered environment. There's the question. This is, this is the part that coaches love, moving people around, little chess people, but they're not. They're not chess people. They're wonderfully energetic, inquisitive people. This is the fun, and this is, in some senses, the work that you'll do prior to coming to your, your training session. So, as any teacher will tell you, there are questions that you can ask that have different depths. They are, they, they're like uh, a sonar of reasoning for the child or the person that you ask. So here's, oops, here's the question. Uh, here's the situation, I mean. Here's the situation. One boy has the ball. One boy is coming to the ball. Okay? The factual question. A simple question. What kind of a question could we think of about that particular situation. What would be the simplest form? And, and even more, maybe more important, which part of the practice would you ask this particular kind of question? Could you arrive at the same time as the ball? It's a simple yes, no. Very, very simple question. And what, what part of the practice would that come? Yeah, I think you're right. The warm-up. So now we're going to another question which requires higher levels of processing because we compare, contrast, surmise. So a conceptual question might be, what cues determine how close you can get to the opponent? So what visual cues do you think that you would need or the player would need to assess as, as they look at this particular they need to look at the first touch. They need to look at uh, right-footed or left-footed. Um, is this child faster than this child? So all of those have to be considered, and that would be a conceptual question. Which part of the training session do you think that might occur in? Yes, an activity after the warm-up, and, and from there on in, maybe. Why? Because we're being competitive, we're playing a game, and that assessment has to be made constantly, over and over again. When and your team doesn't have the ball, you've got to uh, look at your starting defensive position. Am I too far away from that player? Do I think that that player is going to get the ball? If they get the ball, uh, what way should I approach them? And for sure, the, the last one, the most in-depth question, similarities, differences between two or more concepts. So it's divergent thought, evaluative, requires complex reasoning. Now the 9 to 12 are going through what time? Puberty. And that's a great time, but it's kind of tumultuous. It's like an ocean on a stormy day. Things are going well, things are going bad. But also they're going through this wonderful ability that they are now, which they prior they weren't able to have this conception of space and time. They're beginning to see uh, that space and time are interrelated. This, and that allows them to have this kind of uh, in-depth thought and maybe if you ask them which stage of the practice would you ask them? Probably in the uh, third stage, the expanded small side activity, or even in the scrimmage. How would your opponent react if you arrived at the same location and position as his receiving foot? So now there's a technical thought, there's the angle of approach, and then a, trying to make an assumption of how that person would react. So these are three kinds of questions that we would like you to start training yourself to, to ask. 
so that you can help your players become invested in what you're trying to share and teach. The skillful coach constantly assesses and manip manipulates the environment, thus challenging and stimulating players to have creative solutions. So on this line, and it says interruption here, and it says flow here, if I was to ask any of you that have been players, what's the most irritating thing that a coach does in a training session? Oh, I know. I can hear you, I can hear you screaming right now. Stopping the play. It's so irritating. You're just about to score the greatest goal of your life, and the coach said, freeze. So how can that, how can that be handled? Well, let's, let's have a look at, these are opportunities, okay, these are the toolkit. The toolkit, these are opportunities for us to share information. There is one that is not here, but let me start with that one. And that is the construction of the activity that you're going to share. So in order, if you want to teach players to pass the ball from the center to the outside, or to play the ball from the outside to the center, you will probably have a rather wide but shallow field. If you wanted to teach children to, sh to play a ball of 30 or 40 yards, you may very well have a long but narrow field. So that's a very basic kind of view of how the activity itself will lend itself to, the, to what you're trying to teach. Another tool is in the flow, continuous activity. Here, we want to be as close to this as we possibly can to accommodate the player's enjoyment. So in the flow remarks, and I'm sure that many of you, and I, I guess if I ask your wives, on a Saturday, you have plenty of in the flow remarks at the game. We need to be looking at what kind of remarks that we're going to make during the game. Because if, if it's a a remark about what's just happened and you're not giving a solution for the next time, then it's a redundant remark. It doesn't help anybody. Just it helps you to get all of that angst out because you're frustrated. An individual reference can be approached in more than one way. We can pull a, pull a player to the side to give them information. We could address them uh, much like in the flow, but just deal with that individual player. Uh, we could actually go in during practice and follow them as they play and give them constant or um, fresh information about what they see because you're seeing it at the same time. The natural stoppage, the ball goes out for a throw-in, a corner, goal kick, whenever the ball is goes out, me may make use of 30 seconds to a minute, maybe get in there and show the shape of what you want or what you felt like they did and maybe there's a, another solution. And finally, something that's a bit like that but much, it has a, the stop freeze has a methodology that in the coaching license world you have to perform and then if you, if you try it outside in your own practices, you'll see that it does work, but it takes a lot of refinement so that it doesn't interrupt the game too much. The stop freeze is that you have to identify the moment. You can't just constantly do it. You have to wait for the moment that uh, occurs, that something you've been teaching, a concept you've been teaching, a war pass maybe that the player ignored it, but maybe three or four times ignored that, that scenario where a wall pass would have been very effective and they didn't use it, and maybe they lost the ball uh, four out of the five times. So now you stay freeze, and you go on there, and you ask them uh, maybe a simple question, what happened, and then maybe why, which takes a little bit more thought, and then maybe we share what we saw, and then maybe we rehearse it, and we rehearse it until we're satisfied that the rehearsal is the best that we can possibly get out of that moment. 
Then we restart the game and they play on. When do you think, when do you think that might occur the most? Now, I'm not going to give you the answer to that. Tomorrow, when you come in to the license, you're going to have to give me that answer along with something else. So if you don't have a piece of paper and pencil right now, I want you to go and get one, okay? I don't mind waiting because I want you, okay, to respond to what I'm going to share with you now. The skillful coach constantly challenges and stimulates players to find creative solutions. This is an art, uh, and each of you have the magic to light up a player's life. I want you to think about this again. This is the environment. Is it going to be a coach-centered environment, or are we going to try and swing as much as we can towards the athlete-centered environment? I want you to think about yourself and share with me tomorrow or share with the lead instructor tomorrow, which kind of coach do you think you are? How do you share information? Here are, here are four ways. Command and direct. Do you use question and answer? Do you use guided questions? Or do you allow experimentation? And maybe there's another way that you share information. So tomorrow, I want you to bring that, each of you, bring that answer in a written form and share it with the instructor uh, first thing in the morning. Thank you very much for sharing these two parts of the lecture with us this evening and I look forward to seeing you uh, in the morning or if I'm not at that particular course I look forward to seeing you at the D license. Thank you very much.